Derek Sakharan here, coming to you with Ridiculous Hair. This is more a rambling video than anything else. I've got some ideas I need to hammer out for a future video, and rather than adding them as tangents to that video, I figured I'd lay them out here for your listening displeasure. This helped me formulate my thoughts, and at the same time give you uh, some idea of discussions I've had with no real point or purpose to it. As usual, the visuals may or may not have any bearing on the topic at hand, so it's very safe to listen to this like a podcast. With that out of the way, I've been playing video games since they were text-based on a dumb telnet terminal, and I was accessing them via dial-up services known as bulletin boards because the mainstream internet didn't exist. These games were modeled after Dungeons and Dragons in the sense that they had experience points and levels, as well as typically having you fight monsters. When we entered the realm of video graphics, we started with games not too unlike Ultima. Its first iteration was mostly a text-based game, but featured graphics as well. It and other games that came around the same time tried to replicate the tabletop Dungeons and Dragons experience the best they could. As games advanced as a medium, we could very easily look at games like Pitfall or Pac-Man and compare them to games that did try to replicate tabletop D&D. There was a clear separation between RPGs and non-RPGs. That separation didn't last too long. Even with the Ultima series, we eventually got Ultima Underworld, which was a stark departure from classical tabletop representing RPGs, placing more of an emphasis on player skill and reaction time. A surefire way I found to incense at least a handful of people online at a time was to imply that Ultima Underworld wasn't a real or a pure RPG like the classics Ultima 1 through 6 are. And you'll find that some people have their gaming roots in Ultima Underworld. It was one of the first games they played, so they tend to react strongly to talking negatively about it. I like shitposting topics like this because at the end of the day, there isn't a real or pure RPG. It doesn't matter. And yet ensuring that their favorite game is classified the way they want it to be is super important to some people. Getting other people to acknowledge that their interpretation is the real interpretation, incredibly important. But trolling aside, let's be real for a second. For those who don't know, Elder Scrolls 1 The Arena was directly inspired by Ultima Underworld. Although I had heard rumors to that effect, I've seen some descriptions online about it. I actually managed to confirm it talking to some former Bethesda employees on a large-scale Discord call a couple years back. Specifically the people from before Todd Howard's time. If you ever watch a no-clip interview about Bethesda, those people aren't covered because as far as they're concerned, they don't exist. Noclip is a celebration of these companies. It doesn't really tend to focus on their negatives. Basically, if you want to find a company's dirt, don't go to Noclip for it. Not unless the company itself is willing to acknowledge it, in which case it's probably not dirt. Anyway, <laughs> to this day, Elder Scrolls III Morrowind is considered a classic RPG by the larger gaming community. And you can see how everything diverges from the source. You know, you had Ultima, then you had Ultima Underworld, then you had Elder Scrolls 1, Elder Scrolls 3, and then you have Skyrim. And uh, you just look at the, the branches of this tree branching so far away from the roots. When you ask a wide array of enthusiasts what a classic RPG is, chances are a good chunk of people will say Baldur's Gate. Baldur's Gate and other isometric RPGs of that era were pretty much the gold standard for stating what a classic RPG was. Baldur's Gate 1 and 2, are both simulated real-time with pause. What that means is they are actually turn-based RPGs with free movement in between those turns where your characters can perform skills and things like that almost seamlessly, but under the hood, there are actually turns going on in order to simulate a modified version of a Dungeons & Dragons tabletop combat experience. For the player in these systems, stats, skills, and other character attributes are actually more important than reaction time. Much like tabletop RPGs, you're not really forced to go into the next round if you can pause the game. This style of games didn't up and vanish either. While the RPG genre was broadening to accommodate everything from real-time hack-and-slash isometric Diablo games to real-time first-person games like the Elder Scrolls series. Classic RPGs with real-time and pause would continue with Neverwinter Nights, Knights of the Old Republic, and more, leading all the way up to Divinity the Original Sin these days where it's back to fully turn-based. Gaming in general, however, did move further and further away from the concept of turns, also moving further and further away from the core tabletop experiences that spawned the RPG genre in the first place. This isn't bad, but it's a clear point of separation 
where we can look at it and say this is different and has far-reaching consequences for design and player end experience. When you look at listings of RPGs online, you'll notice that nearly half of their rosters tend to be Japanese. The Japanese side leading into the 90s and 2000s, we ended up with a mixture of turn-based and conditional turn-based games. Conditional turn-based games were interesting because they would absolutely punish the player for inaction while simultaneously giving the player all of the wait time between turns. Your player would have an active time bar that would progress to readiness states for the character, but there was no locked turn order, meaning enemies would go as soon as they were ready, even if the player was still deciding on the next move. This often caused more casual, less experienced players to panic and make suboptimal decisions in the heat of battle. When comparing those conditional turn-based RPGs to something like Elder Scrolls or Gothic, where you're fighting in real time and have full command over your character's attacks in real time, it's clear that conditional turn-based games still have a strategy focus, but with an increased level of stress, I personally find that to be negative to my enjoyment. Whereas real-time combat RPGs immerse the player into the action, which is why they are typically labeled as action RPGs. In most cases, a player's reaction time is what's important, many of them having more in common with games like Super Mario Bros. or The Legend of Zelda than the classic RPGs they get their genre title from. I've heard arguments that the genre as a whole has evolved, and now RPGs are expected to be real-time action-adventure games that put a focus on player skill over character stats uh, or other attributes. This is, of course, false, and there are many examples of classic RPGs both in Western and Japanese spaces that exist to this day. The reality is that RPG is a practically useless label these days, and no RPG, not even going all the way back to the text-based days of the MMOs known as multi to user dungeons rolling on bulletin board services were ever able to claim the title of a pure RPG because no game will ever be able to fully replicate the tabletop experience. There will always be a level of predetermined programming versus player expectation where the player is not presented with the choice they would choose. Even assuming that developer resources were infinite, which they're not, time is still limited and a developer would still have to make sacrifices in other areas in order to expand the pool of choices the player could make. In tabletop games like D&D, you have virtually infinite choices, unless you're playing something extremely railroaded, like a predefined Wizards of the Coast approved campaign for Adventurers League, which I'd recommend to almost nobody, by the way. While they can be fun social experiences, I'm not denying that, a tabletop's campaign's propensity to get derailed is exactly what gives them the feeling of infinite possibility. In a well-done campaign, whatever the game master originally conceived of ends up becoming irrelevant in the face of player choices that take the party on a completely different direction or subverting major plot points the game master had set up to be the catalyst for large events in the campaign. This is where the human ability to improv is tested within the game master. They will have the characters answer questions they had never thought of before. They will have to produce locations they'd never conceived of when initially planning out the campaign. They will have to restructure the entire landscape of NPC interactions to deal with the consequences of player action. It's more than just testing the game master. This is what keeps things from being predictable for the game master. Expectations get subverted, and that's a good thing. The programmer of a video game, quite frankly, can't be expected to do all of what I just described in a tabletop experience for a video game. I remember a handful of times in video games being super excited for a dialogue option, not because I was expecting it to branch off into another series of events entirely, but because it reflected the way I wanted to play the character. Typically, games don't reflect the way I like to play characters. There's a good deal of people who play video games as self-insert, seeing themselves, the player, as the hero of the story, not as themselves controlling a character. To contrast that, I've always seen my characters as a separate entity from myself, like a mask for the actor, myself at best, or a puppet for me to control at worst, an action figure of sorts. So my desires for how a player character should act are often divorced from how I personally would act within the situation. I will often, and in fact more often than not, 
choose a role that is counter to my own beliefs and ideals in real life, knowing how much fun it can be to explore playing a religious zealot or an ardent racist or a murderous psychopath. Obviously, your mileage will vary when role playing with a group and you want to avoid making the larger social group unhappy. There's a special place in hell for those who go out of their way to sabotage the happiness of fellow party members in a cooperative based game. You know who you are. That said, no matter whether you are playing a role totally divorced from your real life self, or whether you're playing a thinly veiled self insert, when a player is presented with a list of dialogue choices that is not what they imagined their character would say, it breaks the illusion and steals a bit of magic from the game. The reaction the player has to this is based on the severity of the break from your own desires, coupled with the tolerance of the individual. For some people, this might be a quit moment where they leave the game forever. And for others, this might be a point that they just complain about. I'm usually in the second group because complaining is fun and YouTube is a fun place to complain on. I don't even need a reason to do it. And it doesn't even need to be a reasonable complaint. Anyway, the limitations I speak of are most often the result of design decisions early in a project and are not easy to change toward the end. Typically speaking, the higher fidelity a game's graphics and environment are, the harder it is to expand that game to large proportions. The more voice acting employed, the less likely a game is to have branching pathways based on player choice. I'll be talking about procedurally generated game spaces in another video. Now, AI generated voice acting, at least at the time making this video, is still years away from being able to properly convey emotional states, therefore relegating it to the realm of either uncanny valley or emotionless narration. If I had to pick one for the, a game, I would, I'd probably go with narration. I think that AI voice is good enough for narration now, but not good enough to actually generate convincing scenes at the moment for actual characters. Anyway, another factor to consider when talking about the idea of diverging pathways and their impact on the development process is the idea of missed content for players who do not revisit the game to experience more content. This concept of missed content takes on two practical forms within the game industry. The first form is for the game developer themselves. That is to say a creative power responsible for the game's creation. Doesn't always have to be an auteur, could be uh, just your narrative writer. They're simply afraid of spending effort to not have players see the result of their effort. In the games industry, I actually think this is the minority case at this point. I have a lived example for myself would be World of Warcraft's 40-man raids. I used to hang out with several people from Blizzard Entertainment back in the day. These people no longer work for the company. So I've had a, quite a few first-hand accounts relayed to me over the years we used to play together and even a handful of experiences where uh, I would see their reactions in real time to things. Uh, the original design for World of Warcraft didn't have you as a famed hero saving the world, but rather an RPG reflection of the real-time strategy game, uh, Warcraft 3. You were a single troop unit. You were a nobody, an adventurer rising up from the starting zone to become a soldier in your faction. At max level, you were basically a level 60 NPC with a few extra tricks in the form of class seals and gear. Various quests would state things like raise an army and go kill X. World of Warcraft's 40-man raids were uh, an extremely casualized version of EverQuest's outdoor raids. And this is no mistake because the team lead for World of Warcraft was previously an avid EverQuest player. In other words, they took what they wanted from EverQuest and they integrated it with Warcraft 3 to make a version that was more accessible to people who'd never played an MMO before. That tangent aside, my point is they had player statistics in just prior to Burning Crusade's pre-patch. That pre-patch changed how many of the classes and core systems work, casualizing the level 1 through 60 experience quite a bit. But their internal reports told them that less than 2% of the player base had ever entered the final raid Naxxaramas, let alone completed it. Looking at the sheer amount of, in their eyes, wasted man hours, working on something that so few players experienced, all future plans for 40-man hardcore content were scrapped, and the focus was now on 10 and 25-man content. All of the larger content was retooled at the last minute, but the era of big raids 
were over. I know for a fact this was not a corporate mandate. This was not executive overreach telling the developers they had to do this to make the game more casual friendly. Like there, there are always conspiracy theories about that, but I was there at the time I can tell you that it was just the developers being freaked out that they worked so hard and so long and so few people got to experience that and that's not cool. So World of Warcraft continued to grow with this focus on small yet accessible groups. So World of Warcraft continued to focus on this small but accessible concept. The majority of WoW's growth happened during Burning Crusade, but at this point it was no longer a casualized version of EverQuest. It had morphed into something entirely different, especially by Wrath of the Lich King. It would finish its transformation into the foundation of modern World of Warcraft by the end of Wrath, with a design that demanded players pay attention to whatever was the most recent thing. To the detriment of everything else that had come out before. World of Warcraft became about funneling players to the latest spot in the treadmill so that they would be at the same place as their friends. The intent was that no one ever felt left out, and by doing so, the developers could ensure that the maximum amount of development resources were going into the content that was in fact played so that the resources weren't wasted. Now, if you think this sounds like a corporate mentality where you look at the amount of money and realize you want to minimize cost, maximize profit, you'd be right. Their hearts were in the right place with World of Warcraft, but the end result is the same. With the fear of players missing out, they unintentionally streamlined their approach into something that would mirror decisions done by corporate EA or other Activision substudios. Those content farms that put out safe, reliable products that capitalize on brand names. That brings us to the second school of thought, born out of a fear of missing content. The safe, calculated, minimize input, maximize output. We can point to countless AAA releases over the last decade or two and say, this game fell victim to that. But regardless of which motivator makes the decision, when content is only made to be played once, it doesn't mean the product is automatically bad, but it does steal that amazing moment in some games where you will replay a game, pick a different decision, only to be sent through an entirely new area or have a different member of your main cast. These diverging paths are not exclusive to RPGs, but it is in RPGs that they find the most fertile soil, in a world where you can do anything within the game's worlds that you can imagine regardless of what dialogue has been planned out or not. That's tabletop D&D. So video games that are rich in choices and consequences tend to be touted as the most flavorful of classic RPGs and tend to be an example of pure RPGs because of their similarities with tabletop D&D. The thing is, some games rich in choices and consequences like Fallout New Vegas are not really played in the same way most enthusiasts would describe a classic RPG. Fallout New Vegas, by way of first person, and shooters become infinitely more narratively complex than something like Diablo, which is played in a very similar way to an isometric RPG. Isometric RPGs are touted as being quote unquote true or pure RPGs. Furthermore, the first person shooter elements of Fallout New Vegas would utterly fail when set beside the execution of other better done first person shooters, just your normal first person shooter these days, greatly eclipses Fallout 3 in New Vegas. Ironically, the developers who created Fallout 4, having almost nothing in common with the developers who created Fallout New Vegas, made the conscious choice to learn nothing from New Vegas's narrative. Characters, general, player, story, they, they learn nothing from it. And in doing so, they create a superior first-person shooter in Fallout 4 to New Vegas. But fans of Fallout New Vegas looked at 4 and said, This isn't an RPG. It's an open-world first-person sandbox shooter where you can create your own skin over the predefined players of Nate and Nora and navigate them through a series of binary choices. One of four choices defined effectively two endings. If we set aside how the characters were written and the world-building of how factions were in the Fallout series, if all we care about is in-game scripted sequences, obviously we don't just care about about cinematic in-game scripted sequences. But sequences like that don't make an RPG great. I often hear people stamp their feet and mindlessly repeat the words, role playing game. If you play a role, it's a role playing game. This sentiment is uttered by people who don't think 
if a game has you step into the role of Kratos, not dad of boy Kratos, but you know, the old one, before they completely changed how his character works. If a game has you step into the role of Link or Gordon Freeman, does that make those role-playing games too? No, it doesn't. And yet, you'll hear people quote the incorrect definition from time to time until you call them on it, at which point they will reply, that's not what I mean, as if they hadn't actually thought their words through and just vomited them up at your feet as some self-evident truth that when challenged collapses before them. No, Splinter Cell is not an RPG because you take on the role of Sam Fisher. That's stupid. That said, I see RPG used as a badge of honor or a gatekeeping term. It's very silly. Usually when people do that, they, they actually mean I like these mechanics or I like this narrative design. And I've decided in my head that that constitutes a real RPG. And anything that's even one step more diluted than this, that's not a real one. I tend to make up hypothetical conversations and call them hypothetical as a a kind of a shield, but in reality, they're representative of actual conversations that have been going on the internet, originally in Usenet news groups before the rise of the World Wide Web, then later on forums, and then eventually on social media. This sentiment has been repeating itself since the late 1990s. My favorite game is a real RPG and yours isn't, to the point where it really predates forum software. Although I used to say Baldur's Gate, Icewind Dale, Planescape, Neverwinter Nights are true RPGs. Really taking the time to examine RPGs from the root, the true or pure RPG simply doesn't exist in video game form. And such a video game will likely never exist until we get a whole new suite of video game creation tools long after I'm dead. VR chat is ironically the closest thing to a true RPG right now, depending on how it's used, which is funny. The purest and truest expression of role play is done in person. Much as it's funny to point and laugh at LARPers or live action role players. They're basically doing what is a true RPG. But for those of us with less energy and a lower embarrassment threshold, it's Dungeons and Dragons, it's Pathfinder, it's Shadowrun, it's Grups, it's Open Legend, it's more games than I can encount. It's an evolution of equal parts childhood playground where children can lose themselves in a fantasy and professional playhouse where actors interact to put on a performance for the audience. No longer limited by a location, a true RPG can be played through a framework online, including Roll20, D&D Beyond, Fantasy Grounds, Tabletop Simulator, or for the laziest of all, just Discord. Although I'd recommend one of the Discord alternatives myself, like Matrix, the point is you no longer need to be in front of the same table. You can find people online, form groups. You can be a nobody knowing no one, and then go uh, group up with people and play a game all seamlessly over the internet without meeting with a single person. As for every other video game RPG, RPG out there, there will be a white knight claiming that their favorite is a true RPG or a pure RPG and set the threshold beyond which any commingling of other genres or the removal of any mechanics constitutes a non-RPG and said something else. Unfortunately, because of these people, the biggest crime to video game RPGs has been done. It is now very difficult to properly catalog RPGs without someone taking offense and making a stink about it. Because the term RPG no longer has any meaning within the world of video games. Because it no longer means attempting to replicate the tabletop experience in video game form. It is extremely important to add words to RPG to define it. Baldur's Gate is an isometric, narrative-driven, real-time combat with pause RPG. Divinity the Original Sin is an isometric, turn-based, narrative-driven RPG. Diablo is an isometric, real-time combat action RPG. The Elder Scrolls is a first-person open-world action sandbox RPG. Wizardry is a first-person party-based dungeon crawler RPG. Fallout is an isometric turn-based RPG. Fallout is a first-person action sandbox RPG. Fallout is a first-person narrative-driven RPG. Fallout is a first-person action sandbox RPG again. And people wonder why the Fallout fandom is so toxic. It's at war with itself forever since it's been so many things. Nobody hates Fallout fans like Fallout fans. Every Fallout game is an example of what's wrong with Fallout because it's not like the good Fallout. You know the one. The one you like. Brotherhood of Steel, released in 2004. <laughs>
Welcome to Carbon, stranger. Sometimes people get hurt or killed, but they ain't all bad, you know. At least they know how to party. <laughs> Want to party? Nuclear blast. It's new. It's super. People say I'm too harsh, too violent. A girl does what she can to survive. Let's go kill some foot ass motherfuckers. In this topsy turvy post apocalyptic world, you can never have enough ammunition. Those f***ing raiders. I'm not normally a violent man. You're gonna be my bitch. This is better than sex. Jokes aside, saying RPG, you might as well be saying lettuce when describing a sandwich. At least with a sandwich, you can assume there are two pieces of bread on it. Saying it has lettuce on it won't tell you what kind of sandwich it is. Hell, they might mean a salad or a hamburger. On a restaurant menu, after the name of the sandwich, that's what we really want to know. What's in it? What kind of meat, cheese, other things. But to extreme fans of Diablo-like action RPGs, that is to say people who focus on those to the exclusion of other genres, they likely hate turn-based RPGs, despite them both being isometric. First-person shooter RPGs like, say, Fallout 3 or 4, or even New Vegas, would likely never enjoy a first-person dungeon crawler like Wizardry, where you control an entire party of characters, despite them both being about adventuring in first-person and obtaining tons of loot. Their approach and interface, their encounter design, it's all way too different. Basically lumping all the games under the label RPG does them a disservice. Makes it harder to know what the hell you're talking about. And the saddest part of all, it doesn't even start addressing the vast differences in quality between different RPGs of the same subgenre. Merely the subgenres of RPGs being so radically different as to just completely invalidate the term RPG. To you, personally, it might mean a game with stats, skills, maybe a number-driven game. To someone else, it might mean create your own character. To someone else, it might mean choices and consequences. To someone else, it might mean story-driven. To another person, it might actually be you play a role, although that person is stupid and likely didn't think before they answered. No matter what interpretation you say when you say RPG to someone else, unless they share your definition, chances are you communicated that word and a meeting of the minds did not occur.